Chapter 8. Christy and the Nut Ladies, amongst others. The Bad Habit of Suffering Injustice in Silence. Brecht. Christy at the office again, next day. Yesterday there was a skaterless silence. Today a letter from skater solicitors, not from skater. Christy passed it straight to Wagner, not without thought. Here is something like what Christie thought. It goes on then, does it? I have exacerbated. I am building up too great a credit. If I am not careful, I shall owe Tappers a debt. I shall be overdrawn. But there are all the other things Tappers have done to me, starting with the wages they pay me. Pitifully small. Pitifully. This needs thinking about, accounting for, properly when I have time. As he took the letter, Wagner tensed a little, waved Christy away with the other hand. There was no sign that he knew Christy had removed the earlier letter. How could there have been? But Christy was apprehensive just the same. He knew they could not prove he took it, but he himself knew. He also felt a slight disappointment that they did not know he knew. He would have enjoyed his credit more if he had known that they knew perhaps. At eleven or thereabouts, Christie was told by Wagner to go over to Wages' section and fill a void there for the rest of the day, or however long they needed him, whichever were to prove the shorter. Parsons of Wages was down with a head cold, streaming nose, inflated adenoids. A sad, serious case. Christie's job in Parsons' absence was to carry heavy box trays of wage packets it being payday, round successive departments of the factory and the bakery. With him to pay out, guide, instruct and entertain was Headlam, Bedlam to his friends at school. No joke now. What exactly do they do in Nutcrackers? asked Christy. I've wondered for some days now, seeing the name in the internal phone list. There are eight of them, replied the affable Headlam. And a forelady, you'll see. The forelady sits at a small table in the centre of the room, and she hits a nut with her little nut hammer. Then the other eight scuttle around the floor looking for the colonel. When they arrived at Nutcrackers, there were indeed nine ladies present, but all of them had one or another form of nucifrage, and all of them had nuts of various kinds in front of them on their own tables. When the wages men entered, a cheer went up. Part ironic, part relieved, part sexual challenge. The presence of Christy caused much excitement, and one lady threw an accurate filbert which bounced on his tray before clipping his average diaphragm. Nut ladies, nut ladies, please, shouted Headlam. Mr. Parsons is unfit for play this week because of the inevitable groin strain, and in his place, making his home debut, is our young Mr. Christy Mallory. The nut ladies oohed and aahed, and two commented on the probable size of Christie's unmentionables. They clustered round as Headlam produced his key to unlock the box tray that hung from Christie's neck. But the four lady chivied them into a line, and one by one they took the proffered packet with one hand, and groped with the other beneath the tray for Christie's afor unmentionables. Christie yelped the first twice, and then evaded the others by bending at the neck and causing the heavy tray to lever on each a forearm. All in good part, the nut ladies took it, none of them under fifty. The forelady was last to receive her packet, then took Headlam aside for a private word, and something changed hands. One of Headlam's jacket pockets bulged. Christie, too, was offered a nut, by a coquette of fifty-four, blushed, accepted, and the cheer went up again as they left. Every department has its speciality, advised Headlam. No one is the same as the other. From the ground floor nut ladies, they next visited the subterranean boilerman, who stoked the fire and provided the power that kept the whole of tappers turning over at the top of the catering tree. A very different reception here, confirmation. The boilermen were subdued, did not turn from their harsh work. 
The noise was so great as to be physically oppressive. Headlam led the way past one great boiler, then another, to a small office in one corner, formed of steel partitions. In there the noise was slightly less noticeable. The foreman nodded at Headlam, ignored Christie, and took all his department's wage packets out in a vast handful. He came part of the way back with them, stopping to call a boilerman over about a query on last week's wage stoppages, which Headlam dealt with courteously and efficiently. Christie, tired of holding the heavy box tray while he was waiting, and looked round for somewhere to set it down for a moment. There were some large steel terminal and junction boxes fixed to the wall, and Christie moved across to use them as suitable ledges on which to rest the weight. Just as he was about to do so, the foreman called sharply across to him. Watch it, son, or the whole of Tappos will grind to a standstill. Christie moved away as though the boxes had had exterior and live terminals about to reach out and electrocute him. As he did so, it occurred to him that should Tappers ever debit him sufficiently, he now had the knowledge, if not yet the means, by which a massive credit might be exacted. And as he and Hedlam made their rewarding pilgrimage about Tappers' elementary empire, more and more Christie realised what an opportunity he was being given. A guided tour of the enemy defences, a chance to observe weaknesses and strong points, vulnerable outposts and key redoubts, salients and bridgeheads, and similar war game expressions. Was this a war? Was this a game? After fancy goods, fondant, and maintenance departments, Hedlam and Christie had to go back to the wages section for another box tray. They took this first to the basement. Hedlam had worked out a weight-load itinerary, which he claimed was both the most economical and ergonomically sound that could be devised, where four great machines were relatively slowly going doom, 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 as if in imitation of the marine engines in that McNeese poem. Christie saw that the machines consisted of a central shaft which eccentrically drove two opposed and paddle-ended connecting rods. The paddles each puddled a muddy brown viscous liquid. Christie knew by the colour it must be milk one end, plain the other. A ventripotent foreman expanded towards them. Hello, doom. Who's doom? This doom. Head doom. Lamb doom. Eh? Doom. Mr. Doom. Mallory doom. Tiny doom. Mr. Doom. Parsons doom. Is doom. That is enough of that, certainly. Let us subside with relief into Horatio Obliqua. Niceties over, Tiny explained to Christy that old chocolate had to take a two days thumping to and fro in these machines to qualify as superfine. Night and day, doom, doom, went his worship machines down here in their basement. Doom, doom. Christy could see the sheen of professional passion in Tiny's eyes as he savoured the bashing the baths of chocolate took. And he was not slow in indicating his favourite either, Tiny the dark brown bath, and he explained that this was the only real tipple, all the other seven being milk. Seeing a sadness overcome him, Christy asked the reason, and soon knew it. There were those to whom it was given to like plain chocolate, said Tiny, the connoisseurs, the cognoscenti, the true aristocrats. And there were the rest, the others, the chocolate lumpen proletariat. The observant will be aware that I have avoided a claret-burgundy comparison here, having an unashamed preference for the latter myself, when I can afford either. And use of the cliché creme de la creme was also rejected for its pudding awkwardness. Tiny kept a Georgian-handled gill glass by this one royal bath, and from this he periodically, he told them, supped his beloved nectar to ascertain whether or not it had reached its apogee. A fortunate man, thought Christie, and it crossed his mind that the right kind of foreign body in the bath could well yield a handsome credit. From this department, Hedlam's itinerary more or less chronologically followed the manufacturing process. 
at least on the confectionery side. Christie was as near overawed as may be by the great vats and cauldrons of the sugar boilers, for instance, and saw that a great deal of chaos, injury, and possibly loss of life, too, could be occasioned by a certain type of accident in this department. Christie drew back at the thought of loss of life, however. The contra-entry to that one could only be, he thought at this stage, his own death. There was less that was interesting from the double entry point of view in the molders and in robers department. The whole of one floor was divided approximately in half by a series of vertical grills down which molten chocolate poured. Through this viscoid curtain passed a horizontal travelling belt of wire mesh bearing small molded shapes. On one side of the room these shapes, the soft or hard centres of chocolates, were moulded in great dinted trays. The colours were unappealing to Christie. Perhaps this is why they cover them, he thought. As the centres came through the enrobing fall of chocolate, girls on either side of the belt added the finishing and distinctive decoration. It looked highly skilled. The artful forming of the soft top coating into an arabesque, a coil, a leaf. But mindlessly monotonous for those doing it, Christie thought. Here there were one or two attractive girls but they could not look up at the wages men for fear of missing a chocolate and having it end up as a rejected misshape farther down the line. The forewoman marched up and down at the ends of the belts, supervising the loading of trays onto trolleys, checking the percentages of misshapes. She hardly stopped to take charge of her department's packets, but she did slip Hedlum and Christie a bag each of misshapes of their own before virtually dismissing them. They ate them on their way to the box makers. Here the machinery looked clean and somehow dry, though sweetly lubricated, and it ticked and chattered rather than thundered. The floor was dusty with strawboard litter, scraps of card and ribbon were everywhere, whilst great stacks of board filled a third of the workroom. The atmosphere was as that of a medieval craft guild shop might have been, quaint and yet efficient. No better ways had been found of making boxes, so they used much the same methods and machinery as had been used for centuries, to score and square and cut. At tappers, anyway. The foreman of the boxmakers fitted this setting exactly, was perhaps its present architect. He was tall, thin, about fifty, quietly assured, and easy in his command. He invited the wages men into his tidy little office, discussed football without rancor, drew their attention to this new month's nude on his calendar, expressed the opinion that she would be worth their while coming back to see next week when they might, if they thought of it. If it was not too much trouble, of course, that was well understood. Bring the wages with them. Christy was charmed by the man, but some of the while he was watching points, Christy, of course, paper, card, could be made to burn. The box trays were empty. Hedlum and Christie made their way back to wages section yet again. Hedlum gave some misshapes to Lucy, the girl on the top desk, and offered some to Steganson, his section head. I wouldn't eat this firm's muck if you paid me, said Steganson violently. He always says that, said Hedlum to Christie. How many rats did you see today? Steganson went on, leaping in and out of those baths in the basement. I've seen them the size of terriers. Terriers! Chocolate-coated terrier rats. A new line. Go down a tree to the Savoy, they do. Can't get enough of them. Christie did not know whether to laugh or not. Indeed, he did not quite know whether he found it funny or not. He's always like that, said Lucy. There you are, said Edlam. What did I say? Steganson retired to his desk, half hidden by steel cupboards and a filing cabinet. As Parsons is away, he said, suddenly reappearing, you and Lucy can't take your lunch hour together. Okay, Lucy, do you want to go first? asked Hedlam, and Christie saw at once that there was more than a working relationship between them. No, she said, and smiled. I'll finish this off. You go. I'll go when you come back. So Hedlam and Christie had lunch in the eel and pie shop on the curve by Hammersmith flyover, 
and very cheaply and nourishingly too. Headlam had eels, carefully sucking the clinging flesh from the awkward bone and genteelly removing it afterwards. Christy could not fancy the eels, but had double pie, double mash, and double liquor instead. The thick, parsley liquor he sharpened with plenty of vinegar, and savoured the blend thus made with the crude pastry and tasty meat contained in it. I must bring the shrike here, thought Christy. Since I enjoy it, I am sure she would too. While they ate, Hedlam told Christy true stories of tappers, of how they had bought from Switzerland an especially sophisticated machine for wrapping chocolate bars, which had arrived in an enormous packing case. In order to install this in the basement, the tappers' governors had said, we shall have to make a big hole in the ground floor and lower it through. When they had, with infinite trouble, cut the hole, they opened the huge case and found that the machine had been packed unassembled, was in small parts, which could each have easily been carried by one man down the stairs. Christie laughed quite a lot at this. They were even more clever over at the bakery, said Hedlam of the Tapper's Governors, again, which is a newer building than the factory. You'll see it this afternoon. It's laid out with each different department having a floor to itself, and they became so involved with the proper layout of each floor that they forgot to put any stairs in. Hedlam saw Christie's disbelief. No, it's true, said Hedlam. The stairs were an afterthought. You have a look this afternoon. They were just stuck on the outside. Christie accepted that the tapper's governors were stupid. How did they come to be rich, he wondered. And then he wondered aloud to wages Hedlam how much the governors actually received by way of recompense for their stupidity. I know, or can find out, how much anyone in the factory or the bakery takes home, said Hedlam. And wages section, in the delectable person of Lucy, also deals with office wages but only up to the level of section heads. The governors are dealt with by the chief accountant personally, monthly and by bank transfer. And here is something you will find difficult to believe, Christy, about Lucy and the office wages slips. Now, I am excessively loose with Lucy. I fuck her from our soul to breakfast as often as maybe, which is several times a week. And indeed, I often wonder which flat it is I spend more time in, hers or mine. And no doubt in the fullness of Tapper's time, we shall qualify for one of their wedding cakes, which is to say that I love and am grossly intimate with this lovely wages girl. Yet do you know that when I inquire of her, out of casual interest, how much the head of the typing pool, say, receives by way of emolument, she will not tell me. Would you credit it? I'd have to think about it, said Christie. She is most stubbornly Puritan about this one thing. She has loyalty to some concept of tappers, which I cannot understand. She has been bought, and that is that. In all else, especially sexually, she is most definitely not Puritan. Her reticence in this matter is the only thing that makes me have doubts about making her mine forever. Hedlam sighed, pushed his plate away from him, and, seeing Christie had finished too, stood up to go. On the way back, still having half their lunch hour to themselves, he suggested they have a drink in the long bar. Christie wondered about the wisdom of this, of going back to breathe stout all over his section head, but then recollected that he was on loan to wages, and it was the bakery staff who would benefit, not Wagner. So he enjoyed a pint of Guinness with Hedlam, both being slumped against the counter. I'm twenty-nine, said Hedlam, and I've worked for Tapper since I was twenty. In that time, my salary has just about kept pace with the cost of living. I am at a standstill, except when I am with lovely Lucy. If Steggenson dropped dead tomorrow, I should be in line for his job. I could do it with the greatest of ease. So can he. I shall be forty-seven when he retires. If I stay, if I live. I like it this way. I'm happy. I have all I want. In wages section, Steggenson picked up the phone as soon as Hedlam and Christie arrived back, spoke briefly into it, and then nodded to them. Hedlam explained that one day one of the governors had seen from his eerie 
a couple of men who might or might not have been ill-intentioned loitering outside Tapper's. They had been in a position to have interfered, had they so wished, with the wages men as they made their encumbered way along the road between the factory and the bakery, and to have helped themselves to a number, if not all, of the wage packets in the two box trays, again, if they had been so minded. No men or women had so far been so minded, but the governor's natural caution had thenceforward dictated that the wages men would proceed the seventy or so yards from factory to bakery in a securely locked motor vehicle provided by transport section. It was this that Steganson had just summoned. Christie wondered why the factory and the bakery were not connected internally, but from what Hedlam had told him about the bakery stairs, he assumed he could guess the answer to any question he might ask, and saved it. The bakery was, of course, something different for Christie after the wide variety of the factory. On the ground and first floors, most of the space was taken up with great long ovens, like marine boilers, with cast iron doors. The men wore chef's tall hats, and the women wore white muslin squares, tying their hair out of sight, and the cakes. They all lined up for their wages silently, some of them proudly. Christie noted where the switches were the heat regulators for the massive ovens. On the two floors above, the mixtures to feed these ovens were prepared. Two women appeared to be employed solely cutting lemons in half and squeezing out the juice. They were extremely deft, each half lemon being wrung out with a single thrusting, twisting movement on a campaniform metal mould. Elsewhere, great stainless steel agitators pounded doughs and cake mixes eccentrically and endlessly within detachable bowls on casters. Christie saw nothing unhygienic or dirty enough to explain Steganson's outburst. Indeed, on the top floor of the bakery, the general impression combined something of the cleanliness of a laboratory with the quiet dedication of an artist's atelier. Here was the wedding and speciality cake department, the sculptors with the icing nozzle. Here they could turn out a seven-tier tower for a Lord Mayor's banquet, or an exact miniature of the third act set to celebrate the first year of a successful West End run, and Xmas cakes that brought to mind the excesses of Dickens. Ah, here they even wore different headgear too, both men and women having a white linen version of a Rembrandt cap to show they were indubitably artists. Their behaviour bore this out, being apparently casual and inconsidered rather than plodding or frenetic like the other workers below. Hedlam made his way amongst them, greeting most by name, respectful and friendly. Many of the Isis barely looked up from their engrossing work, so apparently careless were they of being paid. One fat, dumpy lady of about forty-five, however, was jollied out of her absorption by the physical attentions of Hedlam, who put his arm around her, squeezed, then took her warm, icy hand and pressed into it her weekly dew, the while saying, "'How are you, Flossie, my love, my only treasure? "'Christy, this is Flossie, who's going to ice my lucky Lucy's lovely wedding cake "'just as soon as she's qualified for one. "'And you know what it's going to be, don't you, darling?' "'Remind me again,' said Flossie. "'Or what is it this week, darling?' "'A prick rampant, my love,' said Hedlam and crossed balls, gules, on a stormy sea of pubic hair, argent. What else is appropriate for nuptials? Flossie waved a thumb, indicating a stock cupboard with a glass front. Horseshoes, she said, and bride and grooms, hand in hand, bells, vicars, churches in assorted architectural styles, old boots, tin cans, hearts, hearts, hearts. Not very artistic, said Hedlam. Then you shall have it, said Flossie. When, said Hedlam. <laughs> said Flossie. Hedlam kissed her on the cheek and then moved Christy away towards the icing foreman's office, saying as they went, In five months my Lucy will have been here three years, which means that she will then qualify for a wedding cake, gratis the compliments of the Tapper's governors, on the occasion of her marriage. So then the pressure will be on, boy. Then the moment of truth regarding how much the office supervisor takes home will be upon us. 
The icing foreman's office on this floor was carpeted, quiet, deep in luxury, but combining a functional aspect rather like the captain's quarters on a cruise liner. Headlam sank into a huge leather poof. Christy sat on one end of a sofa, and the icing foreman served them both with strong, cold cocktails of his own devising, in glasses frosted at the top with sugar. Then he and Headlam discussed the state of the share market in serious, hushed voices. After about ten minutes, the phone rang. The icing foreman answered it, and Christy heard Stegenson at the other end, in a voice clearly meant to be loud enough to overhear, say, Has that bugger Headlam reached you yet, Alan? No sign of him yet, George, said the icing foreman ritually. Any message? Tell him I'll knock his cock for him when he gets back, Alan, if you will. Okay, George, said the icing foreman, then put down the phone and continued his conversation with Headlam, as though nothing had happened. Christy loved it. The thought that Tappers might be a microcosm crossed his mind. To be allowed to continue into limbo as being unworthy of him. From the windows of this top floor, he could see the Rumieux Go Sedon Tower of St. Paul's Parish Church, the four gilded French pavilion finials of Hammersmith Bridge, and the subtle curve of the flyover. Farther round, there was Mambre and Garten's sugar refinery, a shared interest. It was also pleasant with another cocktail in his hand that Christie forgot for a moment to look for ways in which future credits might possibly be established. The corruption of it. So he steeled himself to ignore the conversation and the view, and he looked coldly around him. He found one way quite quickly. On the wall outside the office were some fire extinguishers of the dry powder type. One of those let loose at random in this white ice environment, considered Christie, would render much technically inedible under the various pure food and drug acts. And, delighted that he had discharged his duty, Christie settled back to enjoy his third cocktail, his second and more careful view. Then again the phone rang, and Stegenson was loud at either end. Ah, lied the icing foreman to him, they've just walked in. Liar, said Stegenson. Put him on to me. Headlam finished his drink, refilled his glass from the shaker, and added an extra couple of cubes of ice. He picked up the phone, and before answering, swallowed loudly, clinked the ice in the glass as near as possible to the mouthpiece, and then belched just loud enough to be heard. Headlam, shouted Stegenson. I know what you're doing. No, you don't, said Headlam sawing at his crotch with the index finger extended from the hand holding his glass. You bugger, Headlam. Ten minutes I'll give you to get back here. Ten minutes! If you want the bakery round done quicker, you old goat, you order yourself to do it, said Headlam, and clinked the ice in his glass again. I'll tie a running bowline in it for you, bugger you. You need two ends for that one, I think, said Headlam, belched again, but more loudly and put the phone down. Perhaps he'll use yours too, for the bowline, he said to Christy as he went back to his poof. What's this new girl like, Helen? She must be something special, or you wouldn't have started her at two points up from basic. Straight out of pastry school, said Ellen. A technical virgin, but already a virtuoso with a nozzle. Would you credit it? Christy thought about that one. And so it went on for another half hour. At length, Headlam heaved himself sideways off the poof, onto the floor, crouched a moment, then sprang upright. Off, he said to Christy, or Stegenson will be annoyed. Cheers, Alan. Stegenson stayed silent and unseen behind his cover when they arrived back at wages section. He's always like that, said Headlam. It's guilt. Guilt. And Christie wondered to himself.